I've decided not to do a separate video on troubleshooting because I feel like a lot of that content was in the last two videos, sort of what to watch for and how to troubleshoot. And so I'm gonna skip straight to accountability. The basic idea behind the troubleshooting is just watch and see where everybody is playing certain rhythmic values and try to decide if they're in the same part of the bow or not and then fix that or figure out what's going on in the music and how to adjust the bowing to make it easier to play the rhythms accurately. And, and by now you've already got those strategies in place to be able to teach those tricky bowings that tend to have issues or the pizzicato or tremolo or whatever so that you can set up your students for success. Okay, accountability. First, I wanna talk about the metronome. And the metronome is kind of a, a double-edged sword. The metronome is a useful tool, but does the metronome provide accountability? The metronome doesn't force the player to stay with the metronome. It's just a sound. And it can provide accountability if your, your students and if, if the teacher is following the metronome, it can help with accountability. But what if they're not following the metronome? And not just in the classroom, but in individual practice as well. You say, you need to take this home and you need to practice this with a metronome because you're not staying with the beat. Then they go home and they turn on the metronome. And yeah, metronome's definitely on. And they start playing and it's, you know, the met metronome is basically just for decoration. I mean, it's not, it's not anything that they're locking on to. And a lot of times I'll have students that are turning in their, their playing tests through through charms, music first, smart music, that kind of stuff, and they'll have a metronome on, and they're nowhere near this metronome. So what is the function of the metronome in this case? Sometimes I'll go into an orchestra classroom, and the metronome will be on, and the director's got it turned up to 11 because they're having trouble staying with the metronome, and you know, they think maybe, oh, maybe they just can't hear the metronome, so we'll make this unnecessarily loud, and you're looking in the room, and you see bows going every which way, and, and nobody is with the beat. The metronome is a good tool and it helps you identify problems, but it won't solve those problems for you. And in some cases, the metronome can actually provide anti-accountability. My suggestion is that you address the technique first to figure out why the students can't stay with the metronome. And you solidify those techniques and make sure that everybody is in the right part of the bow, everybody's using the right bow technique, everybody's using it same amount of bow, that kind of thing. And then you turn the metronome back on to check and see if your teaching was successful. Once they have the right tools to play the rhythms accurately, then now they have an actual shot at playing with the metronome instead of just having a metronome on. Otherwise, if they don't have that technique and the metronome's on and nobody's staying with it, you're kind of just teaching your class how to ignore the metronome, right? My philosophy on on this is very similar to my philosophy on intonation when it comes to the pulse of the ensemble. You know, I, I believe it's, it's part of the culture of the ensemble. I think it's an agreement that the ensemble makes together, like, yes, we're going to play in tune. Yes, we're going to stay with the beat. And so if, if you've got the metronome going and people aren't following it, well, then the culture of that orchestra is that we ignore the metronome and that the metronome is not important. So at that point, just like if something's going horribly out of tune, instead of just letting the orchestra continue to play out of tune and ruin their ears, don't continue to let them play with the metronome uh, when they're not on the, on the beat. Stop everything, address the problem, and then restart it with the metronome and see if what you did worked and if they can stay with the metronome now. The ultimate goal of, of most classroom ensembles is that the accountability of the beat comes from the conductor. Okay, the director gives the students the beat, not the other way around. And so we can get into big trouble when we've got a metronome going on in the back and the director providing the beat at the same time. And the more redundancies that the students have, the more they have to ignore. So even if, if you're right with the metronome, are the students going to be following the metronome or are they going to be following the conductor? And, and that re redundancy creates confusion. The same way that when we're conducting, if we have one beat going on with, with one hand, then they have one thing to look at. If you split that apart and you give the beat 
with two hands, okay, well now which hand am I going to look at? And then it makes it less clear. So we've got the metronome going on. The metronome might have lights and stuff that they can be looking at. The, the director has a baton they could be looking at, or maybe two hands that they're looking at. So we have all this redundant information, but ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to consolidate all of that into one thing. So for that reason, I don't recommend that you ever conduct with the metronome, or at least not conduct the beat with the metronome. So what should you be doing if the metronome's on? Well, you can be walking around, looking at technique, doing a lot of these other things. You can also, if, if you want to conduct along with the metronome, you don't have to show the beat. You can be showing the phrases, the dynamics. You could be showing the, the bowings. You know, there's a lot that you can do gesturally that has nothing to do with the beat so that they're getting the beat information from the metronome and they're getting other information for you that keeps them engaged. The last thing you want to do is to teach your students to stop watching you or providing them something to where they don't have to watch you because you know, most orchestras don't play uh, with the metronome on the stage in a performance. So by doing that, it, you know, it, it kind of teaches them to ignore you instead of just letting the metronome go when you're working with the metronome and you do something else and then turn the metronome off and then take the beat back up here to the podium. Here's my biggest trick in defining accountability for rhythm and tempo. And y'all are probably going to think I'm crazy with this. And if I was listening to this, you know, 10 years ago, I probably thought it'd be crazy too. But this is the one thing that I've come up with that seems to fix everything 10 times out of 10 times. And just, just go with me on this. But my biggest trick for providing true accountability where they have to stay with the beat is using your phrasing to establish the rhythm and tempo. If I'm rehearsing a group and they're getting off the beat, you know, something's happening, some section's rushing, and I go through all the tricks and stuff to address the tempo and it's still not working, there still needs to be some accountability, I make sure that everybody's adding in the phrasing and all of a sudden, problem's fixed. This is because the phrasing relies on time as well. You know, the music's going someplace, right? And it takes a certain amount of time to get there. So it's another dimension of time that's being controlled so that when the section is, is rising or the section's falling, that's another part of the measure, another part of the phrase, another timing in the piece that they're, that they're playing. And it keeps everybody accountable because it's like, oh, well, the phrase is doing this. Oh, now the phrase is doing that. And that, then that will prevent the rushing and it will prevent the dragging or prevent all that stuff because it's that exact layer of accountability that keeps everybody in the right spot with the phrasing. And if you still don't believe me, I'm going to give you some more examples of, of why I think this is the case. And, and if you think about the techniques where we have the most amount of problems with rhythm and tempo, it's the same problems that we have with breaking the phrase. So you're listening to an orchestra and they're playing a piece in three, four, and they have, you know, it's, it's like a waltz and it's like one, two, three, one, two, three. And every time they're just swooshing on those quarter notes, they're, they're breaking the phrase and they're also rushing. So is that a coincidence that the phrase is breaking down and the rushing is occurring? I don't think it, that it is. When you think about compound time where we've got the eighth notes that are much louder than the quarter notes. And so the, the phrasing is just completely destroyed by it because you know they're using the wrong techniques and so once they start fixing the the phrasing you know they, they make it into a horizontal line instead of you know vertical stuff going on it, it fixes the technique it fixes the tempo and everything kind of works itself out once they start using more bow weight on the longer rhythmic values then they're going to stop rushing they're going to have they're going to be able to conserve more bow once they start using their bow weight appropriately on the longer rhythmic values. That's gonna help with the phrasing too. It's gonna to make those tones that normally decay when you're in a part of the phrase that should be ascending. And it's also gonna to help to conserve bow so that the students are in the right part of the bow to play whatever's coming up next, even for pizzicato. So how do you adjust the dynamic range of the pizzicato? Well, it has to deal with how far you pull back the string and release it. And so if they're having to think about how loud or soft the pizzicato should be, well, now they're having to take the steps to grab, pull, and release on the string so that they can play their pizzicato correctly. And so you're working on the phrasing with pizzicato, and lo and behold, it just 
cleans up some of your issues with rushing. It sounds nuts, but just give it a try because for me, that's my silver bullet when it comes to rhythm and tempo, is just make sure that everybody's establishing phrasing and, and that's the one true thing that provides the accountability instead of just double checking or potentially even developing anti-accountability.